in 2759 in a ceremony kept secret from the rest of the Inner Sphere. Alexander Kerensky married former aerospace pilot Katusha Lubmalova. Five years later, they celebrated the birth of their first son, Nicholas. After a brief return home at the height of the periphery uprising, Kerensky would not see his wife again for over 10 years, and had never once set eyes on his second son, Andri. Since then, the world as he knew it had collapsed. Now, he was returning at the head of the largest military in human history, determined that he would see them again. On January 14th, 2777, the go order was given, with the first ships reporting ready at their stations a week later. J hour was set for January 23rd, 1612 Terra Standard Time. The long-awaited moment had come, and for all involved, it was victory or death. At each of the standard Terran jump points, ten civilian vessels appeared in unison. The waiting quintet of Pavese battle stations gave them the standard 60 seconds to transmit clearance codes or risk annihilation. The jump ships were abandoned, however, their automated arrival the first step of Operation Barbican. Each had immediately decoupled their similarly automated trio of Overlord dropships, which turned and raced towards the stations. Within 15 seconds those crews had opened fire, obliterating the transports, but with growing fear they realised the dropships were not altering their collision trajectories. Two thirds of the overlords were destroyed, but it was not enough to save them. At 90 seconds, the ships collided, their holds packed with explosives. Six defence stations were destroyed outright, the others crippled beyond repair. Within five minutes, the 12 observer craft that had jumped further out reported back to Kerensky on the situation. A squadron was dispatched to both Zenith and Adir to finish off the survivors, but stumbled straight into Amaris's Kultrop contingency. Asteroids towed into position nearby were detonated, showering the jump points with debris. They waited for most of the space trash to pass harmlessly by before proceeding with Operation Liberation, but they would still have to contend with those pieces that had come to rest within the arrival zones. 45 minutes after J-Hour, the first fleets appeared. They had only five minutes to clear the area before the next was set to arrive. To get all 20 through took a further hour. Twelve vessels suffered damage from the debris, but miraculously only one ship, the Volga class SLS Richardson, was destroyed when the Vincent class SLS Mississippi Queen materialised inside its bow. Eighteen others had failed to depart, but in total there were now almost 900 warships split between Zenith and Nadir. As they came through, the squadrons moved into position for their approach to Earth. At the heart of the two armadas were the precious transports, mostly Potemkin and Volga-class vessels. Operation Liberation was the final stage they had all been working towards, and it was dependent on enough of the regular army making it to the ground. The Star League Navy knew that they would have to be prepared to give their ships and their lives to have any hope of success. Around them formed the inner layer of escort and fire support squadrons, while the outer layer was comprised of the line and interdictor squadrons. Pursuit and recon squadrons were arranged in pickets or held in reserve, while thousands of aerospace fighters and assault dropships sped between the larger vessels. The heart of the SLDF fleet had always been the glorious, if now largely lost, McKenna class. Starting in 2652, the McKinnon-class battleship was a Martian product from Blue Nose Clipper ships. Despite their insane complexity and obscene cost, a total of 280 McKinnas were made at a rate of two per year 
prior to the war. The McKenna was the yardstick of strategic problem solving for two reasons. One, it was the heaviest armament in a warship at that time, armed with 12 naval autocannons, 48 heavy naval PPCs, 10 missile tubes, and 12 naval lasers. The McKenna is a statement that the SLDF Leviathan was alive and well. Carrying 750 crew, and capable of hauling six drop ships plus 50 fighters in additional bays for whatever was needed, the McKenna was almost certainly the biggest stick of the Star Lake. But it had a secret weapon, which made it perhaps the most formidable vessel of all time. It wasn't its ferrocarbide armor or its sustained acceleration of 2.5 Gs. It was, in fact, that some McKenna-class vessels were very specialized. These vessels were not designed to fight you with the vessel's formidable weapons, but rather with the entire fleet at the same time. These specialized McKenna-class vessels often served as direct command and control platforms, if not strategic relays for SLDF expeditionary forces, and the McKenna's Pride was the very best of them. The SLS McKenna's Pride led the SLDF Command Squadron and also served as component of the three line ship squadrons within the SLDF First Fleet. Leading from the front and frequently in the thick of things, McKenna's Pride was, in my humble opinion, the best command ship ever made. And yet, it was one of only six ever constructed for the Herculean task of leading the largest military yet made. And sadly, it was the only one to survive the Amera Civil War. The McKenna's enduring legacy proves a point. They sure as hell don't make them like they used to. With the fleets assembled, they began the journey towards Earth. As they departed, drones from the outer reaches moved to intercept. For the first 48 hours, they shadowed the Armada, occasionally sacrificing a drone or two in a mad lunge into the heart of the formation, gathering data on how the SLN squadrons would fight. As the number of pursuers increased, the pickets were drawn back and the armadas pulled tighter together in anticipation. The Reagan space defense system, mighty as it was, could not hope to destroy even one of the two fleet groups approaching Terra. But then, that would never have been their goal. Emperor Amaris would gladly have sacrificed the entire array just to eliminate the vulnerable transports carrying the bulk of the SLDF. Kerensky needed to ensure that that didn't happen, and he turned to the brave crews of Task Force Leonidas to do it. Three days into the operation, SLS chieftain, nay RWS Terrans Amaris, the last of the great battleships constructed by the Rimworld's Republic, led the 40 warships of Task Force Leonidas from the Tau Ceti system to a pirate point in Mars orbit. Their proximity to Earth demanded an immediate response from the Empire. Gradually, more and more Casper drones began to move into range. Thirty had assembled by the third hour when SLS Europa let loose with the first of its nuclear warhead equipped missiles. A dozen were destroyed in an instant, but the ship had made itself a priority target for the survivors. Nevertheless, when Europa finally met its end, some 40 Caspers had already been destroyed. Leonidas was armed with the majority of the SLDF's remaining nuclear stockpile. They had no desire to use such weapons on Earth, and the drones were perfect targets for the deadly weapons. Over the next few hours, another 10 were destroyed, but those had managed to focus their efforts on the warships damaged in the earlier engagements, taking five more crews to their graves. Ten hours after the task force arrived, the drones attacked en masse, destroying a further eight vessels. By the end of the first day, those numbers were up to 21 warships lost, but they had succeeded in drawing 25% of the Caspers in system away from the approaching fleets. Early on the 28th, two crews were forced to scuttle their limping vessels, escaping on lifeboats to become the only survivors of the suicide mission. Task Force Leonidas made its final stand later that afternoon. 60 Caspers had amassed to destroy the last 17 warships. A half dozen hours into the carnage, only six remained alive. One by one they dropped, until the SLS Savetsky Soyuz, the lead ship of its class and last survivor of the task force, went out in a blaze of glory. Almost all 8,000 of the servicemen involved in the battle perished, 
but their sacrifice had saved the lives of entire divisions stuck aboard their dropships. Leonidas had succeeded in destroying 106 Caspers in total, almost 40% of the entire Reagan space defense system. 36 hours from Earth, the two armadas began their deceleration phase. Each was being tailed by around 150 drones, half of which were Caspers. The picket squadrons were again sent out, many into the face of certain doom, but all in the hope of keeping the main body of the assault force safe during their most vulnerable moments. For 24 hours, the crews waited at their stations, poised and ready to return fire. The knowledge that their end could come at any second was exhausting. The drones, not bound by the constraints of the human body, could pull maneuvers that would crush any occupants within. They chose this moment to attack. Janos Grek's fleet faced the worst odds. A hundred Caspers boosted at full speed towards him, while 60 did the same against Joan Brandt on the opposite side of the system. Immediately, the two admirals deployed their full complement of fighters and dropships to intercept, but they ran straight into the many smaller drones providing escort. A hundred M3s, more than 700 Void Seekers intercepted Grek's force, even more against the Nadir team, inflicting devastating losses. Nevertheless, the pilots did what they could, managing to eliminate over 15% of the Caspers before they came into range. Twelve hours out from Earth, the warships opened up. The combined firepower unleashed in those moments is unmatched by anything else in recorded history. As expected, the Caspers made a beeline for the transports, but with weight of numbers on the side of the SLDF, the depth of their defence served them well. Six hours into the carnage, the Professor had managed to destroy 75% of his attackers. Though he had lost more than 600 aerospace fighters and more than 100 warships, crucially, only 15 transports had been destroyed. The damaged vessels in his fleet were actually moving to shield the vulnerable dropships at the core of their formation, using their hulls as a form of ablative armour. Brandt had been even more successful, losing only five transports, of which two had managed to evacuate their passengers before destruction. Two hours before touchdown, the last of the drones were eliminated. 196 warships had been destroyed between the two fleets, equivalent to almost half of those losses sustained during the first five years of Operation Chieftain. 27 transports were lost, 18 full divisions. In just 10 hours, the SLDF had suffered almost 100,000 servicemen killed in action. Over the next 60 minutes, they engaged and destroyed the handful of Pavese and smaller orbital stations, leaving them only one last layer of defence to get through. While a detachment of warships moved to destroy the emplacements on Luna, more than a thousand dropships, shuttles and fighters descended into orbit to engage the 30 ground batteries of the space defence system spread across Eurasia. Project Nike had been proven ineffective against the upgraded drones, but they activated their SDS jammers in the vague hope it would provide the orbiting fleet some measure of additional protection from the ground defences. A third of those pilots dropping towards the planet were on defensive duties, and they soon had their hands full as thousands of Imperial craft rose up to meet them. Among the defenders was one of the Empire's newest prototypes, the Screamer Land Air Mech, one of the heaviest lambs ever designed. The anti-air defences over the SDS arrays were formidable. SLDF pilots had to use every trick at their disposal in order to get through, and often that still wasn't enough. One by one though, the batteries were being knocked out. The first boots on the ground belonged to the Special Armed Services. Special Forces Command had dispatched six shuttle-borne teams to those emplacements that air units would not be able to bring down, while five more made their halo drops from 39,000 meters, punching through the upper atmosphere aboard one-man drop pods before free-falling all but the last few hundred meters. The first hour saw 24 of the SDS batteries destroyed, while five more sustained heavy damage. Kerensky tasked a warship squadron with destroying the troublesome Himalayan complex, the SLS Heidelberg raising the Kumbu array six hours later. Behind them, the surprise launch of 18 M3 drones from hidden lunar hangars ambushed the exhausted fleets, destroying a pair of Vincent-class corvettes and the SLS Van Hoch, the last of the Luxor-class heavy cruisers in the Navy, before the drones themselves were destroyed. Another SLDF loss came when they attempted to widen their control over Earth orbit by eliminating the South American STS sites. The SAS loaded six of their elite Fury teams into specially equipped Serrano VTOLs and flew them low across the Atlantic. Unfortunately, 
all were intercepted in the air, encouraging High Command to focus their attention on Eurasia for the time being. More than a thousand aerospace fighters had been destroyed up to this point, a staggering 40% of the Star League's entire arsenal. Of the pilots who had taken part in Operation Liberation, 25% were dead. Despite their fatigue, those pilots continued to fly missions throughout the landings. The Sovetsky Soyuz class SLS White Cloud, the winner of the final Marshall Olympiad, launched fighter sorties non stop for 48 hours until they were finally taken off the line. The Empire had paid dearly for it. Almost 4,000 of their fighters had been taken out, including the outclassed Screamer Lamb. The first wave of 32 divisions, totaling some 150,000 troops and 14,000 mechs, had been plummeting towards Earth throughout the melee, and were now moments from making landfall. Pathfinder units were making orbital drops at each of the landing sites, spearheaded by the Independents and leading battle mech divisions. The very first to touch down belonged to the George S. Patton division at Gagarin. The original plan had called for landings at Beijing, Berlin, Moscow and New Delhi, to quickly overwhelm the defenders within those cities, but ultimately High Command settled on a different strategy. The ten army groups that had fought together throughout Operation Chieftain would continue to operate as independent battle groups on Earth. They were assigned landing sites across Eurasia, tasked primarily with securing as much territory as possible and establishing transport links across the entire continent. Attacking the Amanis strongholds would come later. This dispersion was meant to minimize the risk of strategic weapons being used against them. For the most part, they landed just outside their targeted cities, but with one notable exception. Sandhurst Royal Military Academy, first of the three academies within the War Triad, the most prestigious military schools in the entire Inner Sphere, and site of one of the eight Castles Brian in Eurasia, was the Empire's command headquarters for the entire European theatre and the Black Prince Division was plunging straight into the heart of the complex. Crashing to Earth within just three square kilometers, the Royal Unit immediately established an aggressive offensive position from their field HQ near the Lower Lake. The 7th Amaris Fusiliers had withdrawn from the Academy, but General Gunther Julian was not stunned for long. Reinforced by the 5th Hegemony Patriots, his forces counter-attacked, pushing the outnumbered SLDF Vanguard into a tenuous position only the timely arrival of reinforcements, landed at safer positions outside the base, forced the Imperial troops to pull back. By the end of the first day, the initial wave of landings was complete. Only the landing sites in Manchuria were attacked, but the opposition was short-lived. Scouts were already moving towards their primary targets, with larger formations preparing behind them. That evening, Commanding General Alexander Kerensky himself would take to the field aboard his signature Orion battle mech and lead 17th Army in the liberation of his home city of Moscow. One of the regiments making landfall at Gagarin was the elite 14th Royal Can Marines. With them was a young lieutenant, Absalom Truscott, on one of his first deployments. He had graduated at the top of his class and earned a place in the prestigious unit. In the opening days of Operation Liberation, the Marines ran into an ambush as they approached the Russian capital. The lieutenant's natural skills in mech warrior saved his life, but the rest of his regiment was destroyed. Rather than let him sit by the wayside, Krinsky absorbed Truscott into his escort, and he fought alongside the commanding general throughout the battle for Moscow. Later postings to various HQ positions would give him a breadth of knowledge before he was reassigned by Lieutenant General Antonia Salman back to Krinsky's side to command his bodyguard unit, where the now Major Truscott served with distinction through to the war's end. To review the ground campaigns, we'll begin in the east, where the Japan battle group was descending at opposite ends of the archipelago. They faced six divisions and a strong Japanese militia. On Kyushu, 20th Army had a stroke of luck when they discovered that a training exercise between the 5th Amaris Legionnaires and local militia had descended into an actual battle. The Westmoreland Division soon involved themselves, establishing a ceasefire with the militia pursuing the Legionnaires back to Mount Kimpusen, where they surrendered on February 4th. They spent the rest of the month securing the island, while the 22nd Amaris Chasseurs withdrew to Shimonoseki. On Hokkaido, 8th Army quickly realized saboteurs were trying to prevent a crossing at Sugaru Strait. They had already destroyed the causeway and were in the process of setting demolitions within the Saikan Tunnel. 
The fast actions of the 28th Light Horse allowed them to sprint through the tunnel and secure the detonators on the far side. The rest of the army secured Hokkaido and then crossed to Honshu. 8th Army set about securing the northern cities while scouts rushed ahead to find enemy troop concentrations. On February 19th, they ran into more determined militia at Sendai. They had dug in at the Hirose River and held back the SLDF for four days until withdrawing to a secondary line at the Notori River. Artillery spotters in the nearby mountains called in strikes while a flanking force secured Iwanuma to the south. The militia fought valiantly in a desperate breakout attempt but eventually surrendered on March 3rd. Sendai became the base of operations for 8th Army. The Malaysia battle group had just a single army to achieve its objectives. The 19th Amaris Dragoons had withdrawn to Singapore and left the defence of the Ipoh Castle Bryan to the 16th Hegemony Patriots. While the Quinton Division were besieging the compound, another division was dispatched to Kuala Lumpur, taking the capital without firing a shot. The 218th Battle Mac managed to force their way inside the Castle Bryan by the end of the first week forcing the Patriots to withdraw up the Malay Peninsula. Most of the army was headed south towards the fortified Johor Strait. The 19th Amaris Dragoons were able to hold back several attempts to cross before the SLDF finally established a beachhead on February 8th. By the 10th, the western half of the island was secure, and by the 19th, the Dragoons were trapped between the river and harbour. General Win Huang expected them to fall back to Sentosa Island, but instead they raced east towards the Chungi spaceport, inadvertently crashing through an SLDF field hospital in the process. None of the Dragoons were allowed to escape after that. The largest battle group of Operation Liberation was assigned to Northern Asia. The majority of these forces would move down the coast, clearing eastern China while the rest moved up towards the Arctic. At the far northwest of the continent, 12th Army had landed with 1,500 mech warriors and over 20,000 infantry. Their main opponent was not the solitary East Siberian Defense Regiment, but rather the cold, which at times dipped as low as negative 70 degrees. Landings were split between Yakutsk and Magadan, with their primary objective to secure the Russian end of the Bering Strait. Alaska seemed a probable entry point when it came time for the North American campaign, so Kerensky attempted to capture the transoceanic tunnels to aid in that endeavor. Unfortunately, saboteurs had already detonated all 10 tunnels, including those that ran through Iceland. Instead, 12th Army set about building infrastructure that would help arriving troops transit Siberia. The rest of the Northern Asia battle group landed in Manchuria. The Zarpita division touched down at Shenyang, and secured the city for 16th Army after the third day. From there, they moved to take the surrounding cities and advanced onto the Korean Peninsula. 13th Army, spearheaded by the Punjab Pass Division, focused on Harbin. Only a single brigade opposed them, which steadily gave ground. This was a ruse, though, to draw the SLDF in. At the spaceport, the flying nuns had seconds to celebrate an easy victory before a nuclear detonation wiped out almost the entire division. Over the next few days, several more strategic rounds were fired by militia artillery, but all were intercepted in the air and their launch sites destroyed. The militia's fanatical defense of Harbin would see the greatest use of WMDs during the first year of the campaign, though thankfully only one would detonate. The 308th pressed ahead, and by February 5th, the Imperial forces had fled across the Shonghua River. As soon as they cleared the city, warships overhead opened fire killing the defenders to the last man. The Corps of Engineers played an essential role in Operation Liberation. Their list of tasks were wide-ranging, from construction to bomb disposal. One particularly notable action came at Harbin, when the withdrawing militia Demi Brigade rigged a nuclear weapon to detonate after they crossed the Songhua River. Thankfully, the military engineers were on hand and able to disarm the device. Less headline-grabbing but arguably more important to the war effort was the construction efforts going on within eastern Siberia. The SLDF had determined that this would be a major staging post for the majority of the regular army 
once the time came to move against North America. Unfortunately, the infrastructure in the region was sorely lacking. The Corps of Engineers spent 2777 fortifying the Trans-Siberian Maglev tracks and road network to handle the anticipated increase in traffic and to protect it against air raids launched out of Alaska by the 88th Amaris Fusiliers. While their duty wasn't glorious, individuals like Cyrus Elam, who was fiercely loyal to Kerensky after his family had been killed during the Amaris coup, still earned a great deal of respect within the SLDF. To the west, the China Battle Group had made a heavily dispersed landing across the Gobi Desert. Second Army landed to the west and split itself in two. The Denebola Division and Hellraisers from Heaven pushed north into Mongolia. Ulaanbaatar had become a haven for those pro amaris forces who had fought in the periphery uprising and were less than pleased to see the SLDF. Despite local resistance, the capital was taken in short order. The rest of Second Army headed south into sparsely populated western China. 19th Army, meanwhile, was heading southeast to secure the northern Chinese districts in February, then began preparing for a confrontation at Xi'an. The two armies assigned to the Indian subcontinent would have the greatest number of civilians to liberate. Mercifully, the three Amaris divisions in the region were relatively spread out, and so could be dealt with individually. The India battle group worked in concert to liberate Jaipur. Both made landfall south of the city and promptly ran into partisan resistance. The entire Rajasthan district was on the verge of revolt, which threatened to spread across the rest of the Indian subcontinent. Defending the city were 11 conventional militia regiments from the pro Amaris training camp. Taking that complex became the primary objective, which they achieved on February 7th. The militia was gradually pushed back into the Old Town, turning the battle into an all-infantry affair. The last survivors attempted to flee north, but were caught at Mansagar Lake on February 18th. Most surrendered, but a few made it to the Amber Fort and fought to the last. The Central Asia Battle Group faced perhaps the most diverse environment during their campaign on Terra, from frozen Siberia to the scorching Middle East. They landed as one outside Astana, just north of the main opposition in the region. The Graham Division secured the city in short order, while the rest of Third Army advanced into the Urals. The Screaming Eagles and New Earth Division led Fourth Army south to Baikonur the largest freight spaceport on the continent. A two-day battle with the 4th Amaris Legionnaires ensued, with a large portion of the spaceport destroyed during the fighting. The Imperial troops attempted to withdraw towards the Adol Sea, but were hunted down. Meanwhile, a detachment from 4th Army successfully liberated Ashgabat, Samarkand and Tashkent. Western Russia was one of the most heavily industrialized regions on the planet, alongside Germany and Eastern China. It was therefore a key strategic target. But on top of that, it held a personal significance for the commanding general. Kerensky had made landfall with one half of the Eastern Europe battle group at Gagarin. The 33rd Amaris Dragoons and 9th Hegemony Patriots stood in the way of his reunion with his wife and children, and time was of the essence. The local Kryptia had been holding public executions in Moscow, as they had in many cities across Earth since the arrival of the SLDF in system. To slow their approach, saboteurs had destroyed many of the bridges along the Moskva River, but the cold winter left it safe for infantry and light armor to cross the ice and construct pontoon bridges where needed, supported by the jump-equipped mechs of the East Hartford Division. As 11th Army approached, the Clockwork and North American divisions, led by Major General James McEvity, flanked around to the north to secure the main escape road, while the Blue Star Division did the same south of Moscow. On February 11th, Kerensky's task force entered the city. The Hegemony Patriot defense at the Outer Ring Road was quickly overrun, but as they approached the Moskva River, the Dragoons launched an assault down Tikhonov Avenue. By the 15th, SLDF reinforcements had driven them back, 
and they were again advancing into the Arbat and Yakimanka districts. The next day, the commander of the Patriots personally surrendered to Kerensky at Bolotnya Square. The Dragoons abandoned their headquarters at the Kremlin and fled east through the gap in the encirclement. This is exactly what Kerensky had planned for, hoping that they would leave Moscow if they saw a way out, and thus reduce civilian casualties. Outside the city, they ran headfirst into a pair of reserve divisions and were promptly surrounded by the entire army. They held their ground for one hour before they too called for surrender. Kerensky, however, had just witnessed the devastation of his hometown and was not inclined to accept their offer. The standoff lasted for two hours, the dragoons certain of their impending doom before the commanding general finally cooled and accepted their surrender. Kerensky now returned to Moscow on a personal mission. He and his bodyguard, Jerome Winson, led a small team of trusted officers to locate his family. Despite all the odds, their identities have remained a secret throughout the occupation, and Alexander was able to reunite with them for the first time in over a decade. Katusha Lubmilova had actually been an active part of the Moscow resistance, making her survival all the more extraordinary. The commanding general's family wasn't the only reunion in Moscow, as records suggest that Jerome Winston also found his younger sister Jennifer living nearby. 17th Army dispersed itself across several landing sites within Ukraine, taking aim at the Sverlovsk Castle Bryan and the two major cities of Kiev and Odessa. The fight for the capital was relatively straightforward. Independent regiments landed along the main escape roads to the north, while the main task force approached from the south, spearheaded by the 16th Mechanized Infantry. Most of the defensive positions they found had been abandoned, and all but one regiment of militia laid down their arms. The western half of the city was secured by February 6th, and four days later, Kiev was liberated. From there, they headed northwest to regroup with elements of 11th Army, taking Minsk by the end of the month. The outreach division had landed at Mykolaiv. Turning east, they ran into opposition halfway to their objective, but managed to break through on the 5th. They faced a far greater challenge when they reached the bottleneck where rivers and lakes flowed into the Black Sea. The 422nd Amaris Cavaliers had chained Odessa's residents to the fortifications and emplacements along the coastal highway. Kerensky grimly ordered the advance despite the civilian cost, but General Al Nasser instead devised a novel strategy to circumvent the defences. He sent his fastest units to flank far to the north around the lakes, while a pair of regiments submerged themselves in the Black Sea, emerging to strike at the Cavaliers' undefended rear. On February 14th, they succeeded in liberating Odessa, though much of the city had been devastated. At Sverlovsk, the Chara Cossacks and Thai militia managed to secure the exits within the first five days, but the 21st Amaris Dragoons within would not give up its hold for months yet. With warships maneuvering overhead, the rest of the task force began heading east, back across the border into Russia, towards the site of one of the most infamous battles of World War II, the city formerly known as Stalingrad. While fighting to liberate the Crimean Peninsula, 17th Army received unexpected aid from a rogue AEAF training battalion led by a former SLDF officer, Gerald McKinniston. After the coup, the Major had been told that Alexander Kerensky had ordered the assassination of Richard Cameron as a first step in a plot to take over the Star League. But the Cryptia had only suspected his loyalty to the Empire was weak and so moved to eliminate Gerald in 2776. A successful guerrilla campaign alongside his loyal cadets led him to a confrontation with Colonel Marcus Berger, nephew to one of Amaris's chief advisors and one of the two surviving bodyguards, who had accompanied the Emperor to his fateful final meeting with the First Lord. Plagued by guilt at what he had witnessed, Berger provided McKinniston with a security recording from within the Royal Palace's throne room on the day of the coup, before taking his own life. The Major survived long enough to see the SLDF return to Terra, after which the information he possessed promptly made its way to the Commanding General, proving beyond question Richard's ultimate fate. The Northern Europe Battlegroup had a large area to cover and many former nations to liberate. 
but at the start of the operation would focus on the major industrial sites at Berlin and the Ruhr Conurbation, as well as the European Theatre Command Headquarters within the Sandhurst Castle Bryan. 10th Army opted for two landing sites on either side of the German capital. Madgeburg was secured within just a few hours by the Erwin Rommel Division and two Jump Infantry Divisions of 26th Corps, after which they spread out in all directions, liberating several towns in the first week. Meanwhile, 39th Corps moved from Silo to Frankfurt an der Rode to the east of Berlin. Heading up the Spree River, they ran into their first real opposition. Germany was occupied by three hegemony patriot divisions, the 2nd and 19th around Berlin, and the 10th far to the west. The former were one of the first of their kind, created shortly after the founding of the empire. As such, they received the best training under the Hector Rowe Imperial Division, and were fiercely loyal to Amaris, having far fewer conscripts in their unit than their later counterparts. The 19th hegemony patriots, by comparison, were only weeks old, and were about to have their first engagement, when on February 9th, together as one reached Potsdam. The green recruits held up well until the SLDF boarded the lake and attacked from the rear. The unit surrendered by the end of the day. A fast flanking force moved around to the south to secure Schonefeld spaceport, while the rest headed through the Spandau district to take Tegel spaceport on the 11th. To the east of the city, Back to the Stone Age was fought to a standstill by the second hegemony patriots, but the pride of Carrington were able to ford the Langer Sea on February 14th, racing to encircle the defenders. Only a last second escape through Vogelsdorf allowed them to withdraw into the city. Another flanking attack across the Havel into Grunewald Forest allowed them to bypass defences within the western suburbs, but the city centre itself was heavily fortified. On the 20th, the pride of Carrington crossed the canal to seize the ancient Tempelhof spaceport, cutting off the last avenue of escape. The SLDF began to tighten the noose two days later, prompting many defections and eventually a full mutiny against the Amaris general. The few survivors surrendered on February 28th. 15th Army had split its strength between Great Britain and the Low Countries. The latter task force of three divisions had two objectives. First, they took quick control of Amsterdam and Brussels to ensure those forces around the Ruhr didn't head west. The rest of the detachment moved along the coast and then through the Channel Tunnel to secure both ends of the vital continental link. The remaining 10 divisions would land in England. 15th Army's primary objective remained the capture of Sandhurst, but this was still months from completion. The Devils of Devil's Rock were landing 100 kilometers west to seize a biological weapons lab while the Mantuffel Division took the important spaceports at Heathrow and Northolt. As the 326th approached London, they came under heavy fire from the Burning Tigers, the mercenary unit responsible for the mass slaughter of civilians on Helen. Now at divisional strength, the Mercs were working in tandem with the 17th Amaris Lancers. The regular army pushed ahead until they reached Gunnersbury, after which they established observation posts around the city to prevent a breakout before waiting for reinforcements. The Geneva Battle Group was tasked with not just the capture of the Terran Hegemony Congress, but also the neighbouring French territories. France was the responsibility of 5th Army, who landed most of their forces southwest of Paris, with a pair of divisions further southeast at Macon. The Rigel Cantaris Division led the attack on the capital, which was defended by the 8th Hegemony Patriots. The St. Cyr Military Academy was the site of a lamentable engagement on February 2nd, when a battalion of teenage students loyal to Amaris fought to the bitter end. Versailles was liberated two days later. The SLDF continued along the southern edge of the city, and on February 7th secured Orly Spaceport. That same day, the Florida Swamp Foxes crossed the Seine River, the 150th and 197th began launching probes into the city proper, with infantry moving in to secure the 14th and 15th arrondissements in the days after. Meanwhile, the Carver Division was working its way through the southern expanse of the city, beyond the periphery. By the 15th, they had pushed up to Osterlitz Station, securing the Ile de la City four days later. The Patriots had been pushed back into a pocket around the École Militaire, but as the New Orleans Division closed to finish them off, a tactical warhead detonated, 
almost destroying the Patriots and SLDF alike, along with a large chunk of central Paris. Lyon was relatively bloodless, as the garrison had withdrawn to Grenoble. There, they held back the superior numbers of the SLDF, who were forced to approach down the narrow valleys. A task force landed to the south of the city, surrounding the defenders, who were destroyed in the early morning hours of February 20th. The battle for the capital would conclude early the next month with the capture of Wasi Spaceport. Nearby, the lead army of the Geneva Battle Group was making their assault on the Terran hegemony capital. Most of 18th Army had landed just south of the border, while a small task force landed further north along the shores of Lake Geneva. By February 2nd, they had spread out to secure the neighbouring towns. Two other divisions did the same in France, while the Tobruk Division was leading the main assault force north across the border. The capital was one of the most heavily defended sites on Earth, with the 99th Maris Dragoons, 2nd Tartan Brigade and 13th Hegemony Patriots standing guard. The Northern Task Force was the first to be engaged at Versoix. By February 7th, the SLDF had pushed the Tartan Brigade back to Geneva Spaceport, but could progress no further on account of the heavily fortified facility. Around this time, the rest of the SLDF reached the southern expanse of the city, while artillery support provided by troops across the border at Jura finally broke the Tartan Brigade's defences, allowing the Flanders Division to take the spaceport for themselves. The Imperial unit withdrew back towards the Hegemony Congress, where the Patriots were busy fortifying the complex. By the 12th, the Dragoons had been pushed back across the Arf River. Fighting out of the Old Town, they held the Tobruk Division back until the regular army were able to secure a beachhead on February 19th. Fleeing north back across the Rhone, the Dragoons tried to block pursuit by destroying the bridges, but enough remained for the Stalag forces to give chase. With most of the city now secure, the eight regular army divisions settled down for a long siege. Securing the Mediterranean was essential to cover the southern flank of operations in Europe and prevent Amaris troops based in Africa from heading north. On the Iberian Peninsula, 1st Army touched down at Avila. Most units headed towards the capital, but heavy winter snows slowed the infantry considerably. The Hannibal Division forged on ahead though. On February 5th, they entered the city, only to find it totally bereft of Imperial forces. They captured the Royal Palace in short order, and Madrid was declared liberated the next day. Partisans remained, which forced the SLDF to enact martial law for a time but by the end of the month, they had secured the entire peninsula and crossed over into France. A small detachment was also airlifted across the Mediterranean to secure the Gibraltar Strait. They would be the first to set foot in Africa during Operation Liberation. The second unit in the Southern Europe battle group was Sixth Army, who landed just north of Naples. The situation in Italy had deteriorated into outright anarchy, perpetuated by General Antilos Legos' Greenhaven Gestapo, they had spent the past decade ransacking the Italian peninsula, defacing many of the 3,000-year-old monuments. Bandits had de facto control of the region, the strongest of which were recruited into the Gestapo themselves, which had grown to divisional strength. Securing Naples fell to the colony commanders and lightning bees, a difficult task which they achieved with merit. They finally began to move out on February 27th. With the ground invasion of Earth well underway, Admiral Grech next turned his attention to the secondary targets within the Terran system. First on the list was Earth's moon. After the destruction of the SDS bases by SLM warships, the path was clear for Marines to descend in force on the major population centers. Lunar City housed the largest contingent of Imperial forces, 5,000 all told, but a brief two-week campaign saw the moon secured by mid-February. The peculiarities of infantry combat in a pressurised environment forced the use of low lethality munitions, which ultimately kept the struggle a largely bloodless affair on both sides. Next were the terraformed terrestrial planets, Mars and Venus. Both housed military bases that at one time had formed the war triad alongside Sandhurst. They had been ruined by nuclear strikes during the coup, but there were almost 300 million civilians still living on the worlds. 
Landings on Mars began on February 9th at Olympus Mons and faced little opposition. The majority of the garrison had been withdrawn to Earth as soon as the SLDF had appeared in system. Now, the civilians overthrew the Imperial government and the planet was secure by March. Mars had long been the playground of the ultra-rich. The low gravity allowed for architecture that would have been impossible on Earth, and vanity projects like kilometer-tall statues dotted the dusty landscape. Under the Mars Empire, it became a major enclave for Stefan's supporters among the nobility, with the rest of the planet's population existing purely to cater to their every whim. In case that is lost on you, imagine a planet full of narcissistic yes-men. Ironically, sounds like Terra as well, but I digress. Governance of Mars fell to Duke Reginald Windsor Small V, a close political ally and descendant of the old British monarchy. Despite the close ties, Amaris was quick to recognize the planet as a lost cause once the Star League Navy appeared in system and extracted whatever forces he could for his own defense. Windsor Small was left hopelessly outgunned and was executed by the planet's underclass in a mass revolt. Mars became a major staging post and hospital site for the SLDF's continuing campaign on Terra, as well as being a jumping off point for refugees fleeing the carnage. Venus promised more of a challenge. As part of its terraforming procedures, the Department of Mega Engineering had constructed an enormous orbital sunshade, the largest man-made object in history. Amaris now hoped to employ this device as a weapon in Operation Icarus, but rushed miscalculations on the part of his officers resulted in the gravitational stresses tearing the sunshade apart. Nobody yet knew it, but through their error, they had resigned Venus to a long slow fate of environmental collapse, and today the world is all but abandoned. Also left in a dangerous deteriorating orbit was Aphrodite Station. The sudden arrival of the SLN at a proximity point left the two dozen docked Imperial warships scrambling into action. As they all disengaged from the station at once, the facility began tumbling towards the ground. A seven-hour engagement put an end to the last significant Amaris naval force, but when the Star League rushed to save Aphrodite Station, they were targeted by SDS batteries on Venus. The attack soon stopped when Imperial forces on the ground stormed their bases and disarmed their colleagues. Their surrender allowed the orbital facility to be saved. Last on the list of targets for the Star League Navy were new shipyards from which to service their devastated fleet which now contained many vessels too badly damaged to safely jump to more secure systems to undertake repairs. The swift capture of a handful of independent facilities within the Jovian Trojans, such as the Mercator Campion base at Andromach, went some way to accomplishing that need. The main goal was the colossal Titan Shipyards, the largest commercial complex in existence. Taking it wouldn't be easy, as the station was rigged to explode if the occupants felt they were about to be overpowered. Instead, a pair of warships, the SLS Ocean and Unity City, jumped to the far side of Saturn, burned onto an intercept trajectory with Titan, and then shut down their vessels to mask their approach. After silently slingshotting their way around the gas giant, six boarding craft disembarked and made course corrections to bring them up to the shipyard. As they drew closer, the warships powered up, drawing all eyes towards them and creating an opening for the shuttles to land after which the commandos on board secured the facility in just 15 minutes. The only situation that arose during this time was at the de facto Belta capital, Metis. The massive asteroid had been hollowed out in the early days of space exploration, and more than 50,000 people now lived in the enormous 10 km long revolving habitat. Amaris security forces took the population hostage and threatened to detonate the entire facility, while Star League negotiators kept them talking, a commando team was able to infiltrate the asteroid through old mining tunnels and eliminate the diehard Amaris goons with only a handful of civilian casualties. Eighth Army spent March pushing south through Honshu, psychologically preparing themselves for what lay ahead. Twentieth Army, meanwhile, faced a difficult crossing. For starters, they broke off a pair of divisions to take the Aquarius Arcology, a massive complex located on the Inland Sea. It took them a whole month to breach the compound, bypass the defensive drones, and secure the naval spaceport. The main battle was happening at Shimonoseki Crossing though. As it happened in the north, the tunnels had been destroyed, and the solitary bridge became the scene of intense fighting. Only when combat engineers reopened one of the tunnels on March 19th were the SLDF infantry able to flank the defenders and secure both sides of the bridge. 
the last of the chasseurs were destroyed three days later. Across the Sea of Japan, 16th Army completed the liberation of the Korean Peninsula and began closing on Beijing. Their approach slowed to a crawl after running into a pair of AEAF divisions and more than two dozen militia regiments. A concentrated effort over nine days advanced them a mere 20 kilometers before they had to regroup. Further south, the 16th Hegemony Patriots were chased out of Bangkok on March 2nd and destroyed 10 days later. Far to the northwest, the Mongolian detachment of 2nd Army reached Irkutsk on March 5th. With that, the SODF now had full control of the Trans-Siberian Maglev tracks. The southern detachment was moving through Tibet, liberating Lhasa on the 11th. Their battlegroup partner, 19th Army, was headed towards Xi'an. When they reached the outskirts of the city on March 19th, they were greeted by large crowds of civilians but they were soon horrified to discover that many among them were wearing remote explosives. The 201st Amaris Lancers fully exploited all 8 million people within Xi'an during their defense of the city. Around one third of the population was killed during the following weeks. The Lancers were finally forced out on April 9th, but rounded up 10,000 hostages before departing, which they herded along with them to prevent overhead warships from raining retribution on them. The SLDF was forced to break off pursuit and deal with the humanitarian crisis they had left behind. In India, 9th Army split itself in two. The Bryant Division led a charge against Agra, while the newly appointed Major General Lauren Hayes took command of the Ulysses S. Grant Division's assault on New Delhi. On March 10th, the 151st reached Gurgaon and entered into combat with the 29th Amaris Chasseurs. The engagement was short-lived, the Imperial forces soon withdrawing to the nearby spaceport in an attempt to flee. Two of the five dropships were shot down by aerospace pilots, while the others were tracked to Isfahan, where they became 4th Army's problem. Unfortunately, the capture of the two cities did not bring peace, as both Haryana and Uttar Pradesh rose in rebellion against both the Empire and Star League. The King Henry Division was leading five other divisions of 14th Army south through Gujarat, liberating Surat on March 9th and reaching the outskirts of Mumbai two days later. The 8th Maris Dragoons held their ground along the Vaitarna River for a time before withdrawing back to Vasai Creek. The crossings along the eastern edge of the city were collapsed, forcing the SLDF to attack from the fortified north. The Dragoons managed to hold them there for five days before they were again forced to withdraw this time heading towards the spaceport near Mahim Bay. Unfortunately for them, they never made it, as the city rose up in rebellion around them and executed their oppressors. Soon, most of India was engulfed in a civil war, save only for the northwest districts. Despite centuries of development and prosperity under the Star League, the age-old imbalance between the haves and have-nots on Earth had never been addressed. It was a problem that had plagued the planet since the days of the Terran Alliance when humanity was making its first tentative steps into space. Though nation states had long since been done away with, the fact remained that those first colonies had the closest ties to the administrative districts of Europe and North America. What were most often the richest hegemony worlds continued to funnel wealth back to the countries that established them. For the less affluent regions, neither the Ameris Empire nor Star League had shown any likelihood of resolving the problem. When the Civil War reached their own homes, they saw both Stefan and Alexander as oppressors and took up arms against them. It's unclear whether Kerensky had naively failed to predict the rebellion or knew all along that there would be trouble and yet had little option but to press ahead regardless. Fourth Army passed through Turkmenistan in early March, then split in two. The Ricochet Rabbits and Red Diamond Division advanced into Iran, taking Tehran on March 8th, and then dispatched the recently arrived 29th Amaris Chasseurs three days later. They continued west through Baghdad and Damascus, reaching the Mediterranean on April 2nd. 
The other half raced onwards into Afghanistan, taking Kabul on the 24th. By the end of the month, they had crossed the border again and liberated Islamabad. St. Petersburg was liberated on March 17th, with the last holdouts in northwest Russia falling to 11th Army in the following weeks, while another detachment advanced into Poland. To the south, the 17th completed their liberation of Ukraine. Only the Castle Brian still stood, but with the occupants surrounded and warships overhead, they could retask divisions with new objectives for the following months. Germany was likewise mostly in SLDF hands by the end of March, save for a collection of towns in the east held by the 10th the Germany Patriots. The 75th Light Horse managed to liberate three cities in southern Germany entirely by themselves. The largest obstacle they faced came at an airfield outside Munich, where a pair of experimental super-heavy Berk IIs laid waste to the approaching Light Horse until they ran out of ammo. Across the Channel, orbital bombardment at the Santos Castle Brian by SLS Wellesley had rendered the facility largely inoperable. On March 11th, a special forces team infiltrated the complex through narrow wiring conduits, allowing 15th Army to take control of the outermost level of the complex, with three further rings of defences still to go. The assault on London remained on hold until the situation at Santos was resolved. But the Calais detachment took Gatwick and then set up positions in the east of the city at Queen Elizabeth II Park. The Mantuffle Division likewise reinforced their position at Ealing Common. Throughout March, 5th Army completed the liberation of France, but it was a campaign that would cost them dearly. A full third of the units would be listed as casualties, which was crippling to morale. The Iberian Peninsula was similarly pacified, but with little actual fighting. It was suspected that the Imperial unit defending the region had never left, but simply abandoned their posts and fled as small groups into the countryside. In early March, 6th Army was making swift northward progress when they came under fire from chemical weapons launched from the Ferentino Hills. The effects were devastating, and the Stalig Navy quickly sought retribution. The Greenhaven Gestapo withdrew into the capital, taking up positions within hospitals and schools to dissuade further use of orbital weapons. Precision strikes were still made when possible. On March 9th, the SLDF reached the city outskirts, taking the spaceport to prevent the mercs from escaping. Fighting within the city was intense, but mercifully brief, the Greenhaven Gestapo again withdrawing north on March 19th. By this point, military intelligence had confirmed that General Antilos Legos was with his unit, which was now less than a regiment in strength. The Amaris Empire Strategic Operations Director had been the mastermind behind some of the worst atrocities unleashed on the SLDF and the hegemony during Operation Chieftain. His capture was a priority. The Mercs were finally cornered at Ferrara, whereupon they turned and surrendered. There is some controversy over what happened next. Some say that there were mass executions, others simply that the surrender was refused after similar attempts in Rome resulted in the detonation of suicide vests. Ultimately, the unit was wiped out to a man, and Legos' body could never be identified. The first three months of Operation Liberation had been a tremendous success for the SLDF. They had survived the flight through the system and the perilous landings with far fewer casualties than they had feared, though the numbers of dead were still sobering. They had freed huge areas of Eurasia from the oppressive Amaris rule and were now moving into the secondary administrative districts to complete the liberation of the continent. Most of their armies had linked up, creating a near unbroken chain from coast to coast. Their arrival had marked the death knell for the faltering Star League economy. It had never recovered from the coup, but had managed to just barely stay afloat. The disruption of all-out war on Earth led to an inevitable and terminal collapse. That same fate felt imminent for the Empire as a whole. Mercenaries in particular, with no links to Amaris other than the obscene riches they had won or stolen in his employ, were running for cover. 
One of the worst, Darabont's Damned, lifted off Solar Coffin and disappeared out into the periphery. Several major hurdles still stood ahead of the Star Lake Defense Force. Only one of the eight Castles Brian had been taken, the Terran Congress at Geneva was holding out, and going into April, the SLDF now faced the daunting challenge of liberating three major capitals, Beijing, London, and Tokyo. The latter was the most populated city in human history, with upper estimates of around 50 million inhabitants within the 14,000 square kilometers. On April 2nd, 8th Army reached the outskirts. Holding the Japanese capital were the 71st Amaris Dragoons and the 197th Amaris Cavaliers. Their first encounter came when the Dragoons disrupted an attempted river crossing at Sakai and then continued to pressure them as they advanced from the north. An SLDF detachment was sent on a wide flanking route east towards Tokyo Bay, capturing the spaceport at Narika on April 19th. Fear of encirclement forced the Dragoons to withdraw back to the city centre, and four days later, 8th Army had reformed at the Arakawa River. During the Amaris coup, the Terran militia had largely stood apart from the fighting. Their loyalties lay with their home administrative districts, not with the Greater Star League or ruling House Cameron. While this remained true within the Empire, Amaris propaganda had portrayed Kerensky and his SLDF as baby killers come to enslave the people of Earth and restore the vile despot Cameron. Upon their arrival, the response by militia was mixed. Several took up arms and fought alongside the Imperial forces, whereas others surrendered at the first opportunity or declared their neutrality. At best, they helped to restore order after the regular army had crushed the AEAF. The fiercest resistance was found within Western China. At Harbin, militia detonated a nuclear bomb to deny the 13th Army control of the spaceport then tried to do the same within the city as they fled. The Beijing defenders were by far the most numerous. They outnumbered the two Amaris divisions and even the approaching 16th Army. The SLDF was fought to a near standstill by the militia as they closed on the city, providing them with one of their greatest challenges of the campaign. Beijing had two AEAF divisions, the 8th Amaris Fusiliers and 3rd Hegemony Patriots, but also dozens of Chinese militia regiments. The seven SLDF divisions, all suffering from more than a decade of campaigning, could only just match those numbers. Their efforts so far had achieved only the capture of Tianjin on April 6th. Soon after, reinforcements from 13th Army arrived, giving the SLDF the clear numbers advantage they needed. By the 15th, they had taken the spaceport and eastern reaches of the city, then broke through to the city centre four days later. The Imperial troops withdrew west, with the King's own jump troops in hot pursuit. However, after almost catching their prey, the trail suddenly went cold. Only later was the secret entrance to the Tian Shen Castle Brian discovered. Warships manoeuvred overhead to ensure that nobody left the facility, while 16th Army returned to liberating the Eastern Chinese administrative districts. In Europe, 6th Army completed their liberation of Northern Italy. 10th Army did the same in Eastern Germany, but not before the 10th Hegemony Patriots managed to withdraw back into the Bochum Castle Bryant. The rest of the European battle groups began preparations for their next objectives in Central Europe and the Balkans. At London, the Burning Tigers were growing increasingly worried about their encircled position and attempted a breakout on April 15th. Crossing at Battersea, they headed southwest along the tracks until they were intercepted at Kingston-upon-Thames, after which they staged a fighting retreat through Richmond Park, back across Putney Bridge, surrendering control of South London to the SLDF. May would see the end of several of the few remaining concentrations of Amaris troops. After their first crossing of the Arakawa River was repulsed by the Amaris Cavaliers, the SLDF instead launched another wide flanking attack, which completed its encirclement on May 3rd, when they reached Kawasaki. While a small detachment secured the southern city, the rest of 8th Army began to close in from all sides. Meanwhile, 20th Army successfully liberated the major cities in southern Honshu. A hard push through Shinonomachi on May 27th successfully split and isolated the defenders, with the Dragoons at Shibuya and the Cavaliers at Chiyoda. 
The latter now took up residence at the ancient imperial palace, taking Duke Naruhito and his family hostage. They demanded safe passage to leave the city, or else they would execute the Duke. Kerensky was notified of the situation, but decided that he could not allow the Cavaliers to escape. His refusal brought about immediate reprisals, which included the murder of Naruhito's teenage daughter. On June 2nd, a commando team breached the palace, killing the division's command staff. The rest of the unit surrendered the next day. The Dragoons attempted to flee north, but were caught before they reached the river. On May 2nd, the Pride of Puget Sound and Wellington Division crossed the Himalayas into Nepal. They were approaching the Kathmandu Castle Bryan, garrisoned by the 2nd Amaris Fusiliers. The fortifications had taken more than a year for the Imperial troops to breach during the Amaris coup, and now the SLDF faced the same problem. They would need to wait for reinforcements from the India Battle Group before beginning their assault. Meanwhile, the Northern Asia Battle Group continued south along the Yellow Sea, taking Shanghai on May 29th. London was one of the last objectives in Western Europe. The mercenaries' willingness to abandon the city, which was the heart of pro-Amaris control within the British Isles, had caused internal strife between the two defending divisions. On May 2nd, the building pressure ignited, with spontaneous fighting breaking out between regulars and mercenaries all across the city centre. The Mantuffle division was content to sit back and watch their opponents wear each other out, moving in to disarm the exhausted survivors three days later. A few small units broke and ran. The remaining lancers were caught by the 326th at Elephant and Castle, while the last of the Burning Tigers fled their command post at Highbury Stadium and made it to Highgate Wood before their eventual destruction. The Bochum Castle Bryan became the second to fall to the SLDF after a three-week battle left almost the entire Hegemony Patriot Division dead. 10th Army's Southern Detachment also crossed the border into Western Austria. Around the same time, the last defenders at Sandhurst were finally overrun after a near-continual battle for three and a half months. Unfortunately for the SLDF, General Gunther Julian had ample time to wipe the base's memory core, destroying any documents that would aid Kerensky, and then took his own life. More than 50,000 were killed fighting within this one Castle Bryan. The situation at Geneva had taken a turn against the defenders, who had run out of food in late April. The SLDF was offering rations to any soldiers who surrendered, with several individuals and small groups taking them up on the offer. However, the Stalig soldiers had grown fearful of pressing ahead, as rumours were circulating that the defenders had access to a terrifying experimental new battle mech, which had already claimed several kills. A patrol was tasked with rooting out whatever was still lurking in the city, only to stumble into a well-prepared ambush site. The 90-ton prototype Rifleman III burst from concealment and obliterated the unit commander with a full alpha from its quartet of Goss rifles. It continued to pick off mechs from the company, periodically withdrawing to refill its limited ammo reserves, until only three were left standing. They finally caught it rearming and were able to detonate the ammo truck, catching the Rifleman III in the blast, putting it down for good. By early June, the trickle had become a flood. The dwindling forces attempted to break out, but were caught by a pair of 18th Army independent regiments at the border. The last holdouts within the Terran Congress surrendered on June 10. Later that month, an SLDF checkpoint picked up an individual trying to board a civilian dropship heading out of the system. It didn't take long for them to see through his false identity, and they discovered him to be none other than the Amaris Empire Minister of Communications, Samir Injari. The head of the Cryptia was taken into custody. Later in 2777, Third Army redeployed from the cold climate of Western Siberia to the scorching deserts of the Middle East. The India Battle Group arrived at Kathmandu on June 17th, and in conjunction with Second Army, the SLDF forced its way inside to take control the next month. After that, the 9th and 14th returned to India, which was still in open rebellion. It took four months for 16th Army to clear out the Tian Sheng complex. Thousands were wounded by the Imperial Divisions, who fought to the bitter end. Niigata was the penultimate target to be liberated by 8th Army in early July. 
the Japan battle group now closed from both sides on the Takayama Castle Bryan. Inside were the 8th Amaris Legionnaires and the Warriors of Dawn mercenary unit. Both were experienced units that would not make life easy for the SLDF. Eleventh Army continued to work with the Kiev detachment as they pushed west into Hungary and Romania. Both were hotbeds of Amaris supporters, and restoring order proved almost impossible. The second detachment of 17th Army liberated Istanbul on July 11th, then took Sofia one week later. 10th Army was advancing in two different directions. Vienna fell on June 25th, then Czechia and Slovakia the following month. The other detachment liberated Copenhagen on July 7th, then crossed the Ursen Bridge into Scandinavia. The rest of the Northern Europe battle group joined them early the next month, after taking Ireland in July. The Geneva and Southern Europe battle groups joined forces and began preparing for the first stages of the African campaign. The various Mediterranean islands were taken throughout July and August, and they began launching aerial reconnaissance raids over the southern continent, and even some across the Atlantic. The 1st and 7th Alician Rangers, which had accompanied the SLDF to Earth, were distressed to find that their home base in Sicily had been ruined. Sadly, neither would survive to the end of the campaign. Later in August, 17th Army also reached Athens, the last European city to be liberated. The depredations of the 201st Amaris Lancers, the unit responsible for the massacre at Xi'an, continued throughout the rest of 2777. The Stalig Navy's difficult decision not to sacrifice the hostages had created a situation where most of the Chinese districts had joined India in open revolt. Only the final destruction of the Lancers at Wuhan in November brought about an end to the rebellion, and India was mollified early the next year. The Battle for Terror was unquestionably a violent affair that resulted in the deaths of millions of civilians, on top of the military casualties. That said, it was comparatively clean compared to some of the other planets targeted in Operation Chieftain. Scorched Earth tactics were seldom employed and the Empire was particularly reserved in their deployment of WMDs. Kerensky, of course, had completely forbidden their use outside of precision orbital strikes from overhead warships. The worst atrocities that took place happened in China, where the 201st Amaris Lancers committed abhorrent acts, like forcing refugees to detonate hidden explosive charges after they made contact with the SLDF troops, or even strapping civilians to their mechs to deter Kerensky's forces from firing on them. Dealing with this barbarity fell to the 19th Army. At the forefront of their advance was Major General John Fletcher and the liberators of Java, who handled the difficult task with merit. Even after hunting down these perpetrators, they were left with a humanitarian crisis and a region that rose in revolt. The China Battle Group spent the next two years on pacification duty, recuperating from the brutality that they'd witnessed, and in some cases had been forced to deal out themselves. The 11-month siege of the Svredlovsk Castle Bryan came to an end on January 19th. Takayama became the last Castle Bryan to fall later that summer when the Warriors of Dawn were able to negotiate a deal with the SLDF that would allow the unit to leave Earth. Throughout Operation Chieftain, no member of the Stalig Navy had distinguished themselves as much as Admiral Marina Akayev Cameron. Her anti-STS tactics had saved the lives of many within the SLDF. It's no surprise that Admiral Grek turned to her to sweep up the last of the systems that had been bypassed on the way to Terra. With the fleets repaired and refitted, Akayev Cameron targeted first the largest drone fleet at Thorin in November 2777. The remnants of her fourth fleet, now again employing the Project Night Jammers to good effect, next moved to Zolokofen in January, Terra Firma followed in March, and lastly Epsilon Indy in July. Unfortunately, those behind the planning of this side campaign had made a terrible oversight. Kerensky had not spared any of the regular army, instead being content to blockade the Imperial troops on those planets. When the civilians unexpectedly took to the street in protest of the Amaris government, they faced brutal reprisals from the HSF and OPD. The navy in orbit was powerless to lend any assistance while the garrison forces remained within the cities. 
the Gemini citizens bore the brunt of their rage and frustration, something which would come back to haunt the Star League. With the Eurasian campaign winding down in 2778, High Command began looking towards their next targets. Among the casualties of Operation Liberation so far were more than a million civilians and almost a hundred thousand from the SLDF, some 30% of the regular army in total. Two divisions had been destroyed by nuclear detonations, and a further 11 had been disbanded. Penciled in for that summer was the simultaneous invasion of Africa and South America, isolating Stefan Amaris on the North American continent. Each had a trio of functional castles Bryan, but apart from a few divisions sent across to secure the Straits of Gibraltar, the Starleague had no presence on either landmass so far. Lieutenant General Antonia Solman, who had nearly been killed at his Brazilian residence by an assassination team during the coup, was tasked with drawing up the invasion plan for his home continent. As the difficulties in pacifying China and India continued, Kerensky realised that he could not become bogged down in similar campaigns in the Southern Hemisphere. Instead, they would use what strength they had left for a final push towards Unity City. Some Imperial units could see the writing on the wall either way and took the opportunity to flee the planet. Few made it through the blockade, but the 141st Amaris Dragoons were one of the lucky ones. Preparations for the Africa assault continued along the Mediterranean, but this was an SLDF counterintelligence operation to mislead the Empire. The real goal was reaching North America. Earlier in the campaign, the Empire had collapsed the transoceanic tunnels that once ran below the Bering Strait and had even connected Europe through Iceland. Furthermore, defensive installations along the Pacific Wall had been fortified to the point where an amphibious landing would be disastrous. With the American SDS batteries intact, orbital manoeuvres were out of the question too. That left them two approaches. The first was to use low-flying aerodyne dropships such as the Leopard class to skim the surface of the ocean and touch down in Alaska. Beginning in October 2778, the Eastern Europe and Northern Asia battle groups relocated to Chukotka and began training in the Siberian wilderness for the upcoming assault. The second approach was through a narrow corridor over the ocean that would take them to Mexico. The India battle group was selected for this operation. Their route would bring them into range of the Indonesian, Australian and Pacific arrays and so a supporting campaign pushing south from Asia would clear the path. The Japan battle group relocated to Taiwan and was reinforced by the Malaysia battle group, together taking on responsibility for the Pacific. The Central Asia battle group relocated to India and prepared for their assault on Australia. The attacks were scheduled for January 7th. Before the next phase of Operation Liberation could begin, the SLDF undertook a number of preliminary actions. In November, Pathfinders were dispatched to the new continents to identify and mark the best landing sites, while commando teams were tasked with the destruction of the many STS batteries. Several major Indonesian ports were captured in December ahead of the main forces' arrival. Things almost went wrong on New Year's Day when a commando team was discovered by the HSF in Mexico, but mass aerial raids over Africa and Southern America meant the HSF report was overlooked. On January 3rd, Two regiments of the Filtwelt Fusiliers made landfall in Western Australia, heading for the Hammersley SDS arrays. Five of the installations were captured, while the last two were bombarded from orbit. The unit's other two regiments landed on the beaches surrounding Perth. They would secure the city on January 7th, moments before the rest of 69th Corps was set to arrive. The Pacific Battle Group departed from their bases late in the night on January 4th. They were supported in their actions by the vast majority of the available Cam Marine regiments, who were best equipped for the terrain. Southeast Asia had a minimum of defenders, but it still proved a costly campaign for the SLDF. Five transports were destroyed crossing the South China Sea, and the defenders of Io suffered a nuclear strike in the Java Sea. The next morning, the three armies made simultaneous landfall across the major islands of Indonesia and the Philippines. 20th faced only a single regiment of defenders, but taking the three arrays proved costly as they had to contend with several hostage situations. The Western Islands had six battalions of mixed mercenary and hegemony patriot forces, 
who made full use of ambushes and booby traps to inflict heavy casualties around Lake Lautawa. Borneo had the strongest defence in the form of Cutler's Vagabonds, who again used human shields to prevent their destruction and demoralise the SLDF. Commando teams were used to secure the Indonesian SDSs where possible, which helped keep civilian casualties to a minimum. In the 48 hours before the invasion of North America was set to begin, four Central American SDSs were destroyed, clearing a path for two divisions of the Mexico battle group to make the crossing. The Australia and Mexico battle groups commenced their attack on the 7th as planned, but on account of extreme weather in Alaska, Operation Anchorhead was postponed until a safe crossing could be attempted. In southern Mexico, the Marne and Ulysses S. Grant divisions risked drops amid the still-functioning STS batteries, while the majority of 9th Army landed at safer Acapulco. Almost a full brigade was lost in the approach, but it allowed the SLDF to quickly eliminate the remaining installations and establish air superiority. The 9th dropships now transported the rest of the army to their targets. Mexico was one of the regions that had been particularly hard hit by Richard Cameron's disastrous rule. Amaris had found support for his takeover not just with the district's nobility, but also among several militant groups. After playing a small part in the coup, these armed gangs joined the fledgling Amaris Empire armed forces as the Mexican Legion, which by the time of Operation Liberation had expanded to three full regiments. One of their units was known to be in Northern Africa, most likely operating out of the Cairo Castle Bryan. They had repulsed several attempts by the Third Army to move out of the Middle East and establish a presence in Egypt. Their main strength remained in North America, where, unlike the native Terran militia, they would fight against the SLDF's advance every step of the way. Kerensky's assurances that he was not trying to install himself as a military dictator, words meant to belie the fears of the council lords, played directly into Amaris's propaganda that the SLDF had come to restore the hated Cameron dynasty. 69th Corps touched down at Perth a few hours after taking off and began a lightning advance east. Far along the coast, an advance team led by the 25-37th Jump Infantry Regiment landed at Adelaide, but their beachhead was quickly overrun by the 53rd Amaris Fusiliers, and the task force was virtually wiped out. On January 9th, after sprinting halfway across the continent, 69th avenged their fallen brethren by taking the city. The remaining three Third Army Corps now joined them in Australia, with each assigned to one of the coasts. The priority targets for them were eliminating the SDS batteries spread throughout the Great Dividing Range to allow for warship support in the attack on the Glen Valley Castle Bryan. On January 15th, the weather had cleared enough for Operation Anchorhead to commence. The Meteors and Antarctica Division made the first landings along the Seward Peninsula at 0330 Terra Standard Time. Immediately, the 88th Amaris Fusiliers attempted to dislodge them the first engagements coming three hours later. Five of the 19 landing sites were eliminated, but the others held on thanks to constant sorties launched by SLDF aerospace fighters. One of the units that distinguished itself during the invasion was Major Stephen Cage's 200th Dragoons, who could switch between recon and fast strikes to great effect. Combat engineers were hard at work clearing landing strips in the ice, the first of which was completed at 11.30 Terra Standard Time. Aerodyne dropships now bust across the rest of 11th and 12th armies. A last-ditch attempt was made by the Empire to halt the invasion when they launched four nuclear weapons against the SLDF. Thousands were killed, but Kerensky's forces clung on, and by the end of the month were advancing off the peninsula. The defence of North America was compromised from the get-go, as it was reported that an increasingly unsound Stefan Amaris was taking command of operations. The Pacific Battle Group liberated East Timor and New Guinea in late January, and were now preparing naval assaults against the few remaining STS batteries spread among the Mariana, Marshall and Solomon Islands. Imperial forces in Melbourne put up a determined defence, but couldn't stand against the 17th and 69th Corps. The rest of 3rd Army regrouped at Canberra on the 30th. With the destruction of the last of the STS by the Filtbelt Fusiliers early the next month, 
warships were called in to bombard the Glen Valley Castle Bryan. The defenders surrendered after just two weeks. Throughout the latter stages of the war, rumours began to circulate about Third Army's treatment of POWs, with some reports suggesting summary executions or worse. The massacre of HSF and OPD officers finally forced High Command to take action. It was discovered that General Jack Lucas had allowed these atrocities to take place, and so on February 12th, Deputy Commanding General de Chevalier was forced to replace one of his best officers. Fourth Army had suffered heavy losses during the Asian campaign, and were now reduced to just a single corps. With most of Australia secure by mid-February, they hopped across to New Zealand, where they faced only light resistance at the White Cliffs Castle Bryan, surrendering only two days into the bombardment after a mutiny within. Back in Central America, the Ulysses S. Grant Division was approaching Mexico City. Rather than try to fight the far larger force, the 1st Mexican Legion sabotaged as much infrastructure as they could within the capital before withdrawing north, leaving a humanitarian crisis in their wake. The SLDF was aided in their recovery efforts by the 44th Hegemony Patriot Regiment, after which they set off in pursuit. At this moment, the Wraiths, acting as the lead element of 14th Army, made landfall around Guadalajara. They moved east and intercepted the fleeing AEAF unit at Celaya, destroying them utterly in just one hour. With the Pacific SDSs offline, the rest of 14th Army flew across the ocean to make landfall in Sonora and along the Baja Peninsula. This drew the attention of nearby Imperial forces, who moved south across the border, while flights launched out of California and Nevada kept the SLDF bottled up throughout February. The Wraiths were heading up the coast, attempting to regroup, but faced their own obstacle at Los Mochis. The lead armies of Operation Anchorhead succeeded in capturing Nome at the beginning of the month, securing its valuable spaceport. This allowed for the heavier elements of the 11th and 12th to be brought across, and they began moving towards their next objectives. The former made its way through the Alaska Range, arriving at Anchorage one week after 17th Army had made their naval assault. The latter moved towards Fairbanks, destroying the polar SDSs and securing the city by late February. The rest of the Northern Inland Battle Group now made landfall in North America. Between them, the five armies wiped out the Empire's two divisions tasked with the defense of Alaska. In the Southern Hemisphere, the Australian forces were redesignated as the California Battle Group ahead of their planned redeployment to North America. Fourth and Seventh Armies arrived at Honolulu in the final week of February, alongside what was left of the Volunteer Brigades where once there had been 12 brigades, more than 90% casualties had reduced them to a mere 8 battalions. Amaris's decision to withdraw forces from the east coast to reinforce Alaska would prove particularly short-sighted, as it allowed an opportunity to land another wave of armies along the Atlantic. The former Northern Europe, now Northeast Battle Group, moved from Iceland to liberate Greenland in February. They would soon be landing along the Labrador coast. First Army was the lead unit of the new Southeast Battle Group, hopping from the Azores to Bermuda. Ninth Army was determined to reach Florida ahead of their arrival to support the landing. They crossed the Rio Grande early in March and began clearing the heavily defended cities along the Gulf of Mexico. Major General Lauren Hayes of the Ulysses S. Grant Division spearheaded the attacks, losing an arm in the fierce fighting around Houston. Third Army, straight from their victory in Australia, touched down along the Gold Coast, and with support from 14th Army, overran the brigade of defenders in the area. The two units moved inland to destroy the SDS batteries outside Los Angeles and the fighter bases that had been given the 14th such trouble in Mexico. 9th Army reached their objective the following week, just as the 1st were making landfall. The two of them regrouped at New Orleans to fight off an attack from the north after which the new arrivals laid siege to the 203rd Republican Guard within the Hilton Head Castle Bryan, while 9th Army spent the rest of the month regrouping with their battle group partner back west. Further up the Atlantic coastline, the Northeast Battle Group divided itself between Long Island and Western Canada. On loan to 10th Army was the George S. Patton Division, which spearheaded the attack on New York. There, they faced off against the 18th Amaris Chasseurs, the so-called Death's Head Regiment, led by Colonel Gunther von Strang. His reputation for cruelty among the locals had earned him the nickname Vampire, 
and he was one of the most despised among the SLDF. His unit was crushed trying to escape from LaGuardia spaceport. The Strang family had been firm Amara supporters for generations. The vampire, Gunther von Strang, had been awarded control over much of Western North America in much the same way Lagos had been given Italy as his personal fife. If this includes Canada, why did we get stuck with a guy with an edgy alias? His death at the hands of the SLDF was a blow to the Empire's control of the region. Out in the periphery, one of the loyalist elements that had gone to ground during Kransky's invasion was led by Baron Nico von Strang. Located on the planet Aaron, they lay beyond the new border established by the Lyran Commonwealth during Operation Almeric. Crucially, they were now in possession of one of the Empire's few remaining shipyards. In 2780, Nico would establish the Barony of Strang as a successor to the now defunct Rimworld's Republic, using the threat of another Lyran invasion to exert complete control of the planet's population and rule as a petty king. I mean, as far as that goes, petty king is probably an upgrade. The majority of the Northeast Battle Group headed west, sweeping along both sides of the Great Lakes. 15th Army broke off a detachment to besiege the Port Alfred Castle Bryan, while the rest of the unit continued ahead. Meanwhile, two 10th Army divisions headed south from New York, and by the end of March had met up in Virginia with elements of 1st Army advancing north. Over in the northwest, the Inland Battle Group had moved into the Canadian Yukon, while 11th and 17th Armies had the difficult task of moving through the coast mountains within British Columbia. All told, the Alaskan campaign would suffer more casualties as a result of freezing weather than all the efforts of the Amaris Empire combined. Progress towards Unity City was very slow. The SLDF suffered a major loss when the Stonewall Jackson Division was destroyed near Charlottesville by the 84th and 89th Amaris Dragoons. The Imperial forces moved north to intercept the rest of First Army, but were ambushed by the Footsack and 114th Hussars, after which they withdrew into the Appalachians. It took three weeks to pin the Dragoons down and destroy them. 10th Army faced only minor obstacles at Pittsburgh and Detroit, while the 15th streaked ahead through Canada. Back at the Gold Coast, the Van Diemen Division was spearheading the Mexico battle group's advance north, up the Sierra Nevada mountains. To their west, the rest of the California battle group reached the continent, and together they advanced up past San Francisco. The Amaris divisions in front of them were very disciplined in their slow withdrawal north. Kerensky attempted to surround them with surprise coastal landings, but the Imperial units maintained discipline and withdrew into Oregon. The SLDF tried landing dropships in the rear to break the AEAF, but again this proved unsuccessful. 10th Army continued their advance west, liberating Chicago and then moving towards Wisconsin. The last significant opposition they faced in the Midwest was the 2nd Mexican Legion, which fled towards Unity City after taking more than 50% casualties. The 1st and 10th crossed the Mississippi, the former advancing into the Rocky Mountains, while the rest of the Southeast Battle Group landed at Charleston, South Carolina behind them. Their goal now was to reach the Gunnison Castle Bryan and link up with the Mexico Battle Group beyond. 15th Army completed their march through Canada, heading south to regroup at Spokane, after which the Northeast Battle Group pacified the area around Banks Lake. By the end of May, the Operation Anchorhead Task Force had advanced in sight of Vancouver Island. The first of three regiments began crossing on June 3rd, securing the coast shortly afterwards. Until this point, the Central Asia Battle Group had been held in reserve, but on June 7th, fresh reinforcements from 19th Army arrived to help take Victoria. By this point in the war, many of the divisions within the SLDF were less than 40% operational, and so the reserve was desperately needed. However, the four experienced battalions defending the island managed to slow the overwhelming SLDF force in the mountains. On the mainland, the Northern Inland Battle Group was making their first assault on Kamloops, but were repulsed by Imperial units within. A second attempt followed a couple weeks later, but was again turned back. The main battle lines had been drawn up along the Columbia River surrounding Unity City. 14th Army was the first to arrive early in June, with the third hot on their heels. Soon, three armies were besieging Portland, while the first moved into a supporting role behind them. To the east, 6th and 10th armies took up positions at Kennewick. They were the only units to make it across the Columbia in June, but were forced to withdraw in the face of stiff opposition. 
Lastly, 15th Army was the furthest upriver at Buenachi. While they were preparing their assault, they re-established contact with Elizabeth Hazen, leader of the Ghosts of the Black Watch. Despite Amaris's best efforts to eradicate them, the First Lord's former bodyguards had refused to die and fought a guerrilla campaign lasting a dozen years. The defenders at Kamloops were finally overrun at the third time of asking on June 28th, with the last of the Imperial forces hunted down over the next two days. SLDF Pathfinders also crossed to the Olympic Peninsula towards the end of the month. As 16th Army closed on Vancouver, the Imperial Brigade within recalled its forces from the island. The SLDF reached the city's outskirts on July 15th, with 19th Army crossing soon after to assist in the blockade. The rest of the northern coast and inland battle groups mopped up the last of the resistance in British Columbia, then spent the next month preparing for their assault on Unity City. The second crossing of the Columbia ended in disaster for the people of Portland. One of the dams upriver was destroyed to sweep away the advancing SLDF, but in the process devastated a quarter of the city. After laying siege to Portland for three weeks, Kerensky moved his armies in to assist the civilian population and eliminate the last of the defenders. The 10th Army was able to establish a permanent beachhead across the river in July. Serenity under fire pursued the retreating forces up into the Rattlesnake Hills, while Back to the Stone Age flanked the defenders at Kennewick, allowing 6th Army to cross. The Erwin Rommel Division, meanwhile, was leading 4th Corps in an assault on Yakima, capturing the city on July 26th. The Northeast Battle Group now closed ranks and prepared to advance on Unity City from the east. The last line of defences were located within the Cascade Mountains, where hidden weapon emplacements threatened to exact a heavy toll. Before they began their assault, they caught a member of the local resistance trying to infiltrate their camp. This transpired to be none other than Colleen Schmidt, granddaughter of the former Royal Blackwatch Colonel Hanny Schmidt. She was able to report on all the concealed firing positions within the mountains, though it still took until the end of August to eliminate them all. Despite over a decade of crackdowns by the various branches of the Imperial government, Amaris had never succeeded in ridding Terra of resistance movements. They were particularly prevalent within North America. The exploits of Elizabeth Hazen and the Ghosts of the Black Watch are well documented, but others such as rebels operating out of the Cascade Mountains did their part to disrupt the Empire's function. Another band, known as the Spirit of the Coyote, made the southwestern deserts a dangerous area to operate in for the Empire. One remarkable individual to come out of this group was Dana Kufal. Her parents were part of the Terran security forces that had escaped the coup but were tracked down in 2773 when she was less than a year old. Adopted by a group of Native American freedom fighters, she grew up learning both the tactics of the armed resistance but also their spiritual connection to their namesake animal. When the SLDF made contact with the Coyote tribe, they were shocked to discover that an eight-year-old girl was helping to overthrow Amaris. Meanwhile, Sixth Army was racing downriver to assist the units in Portland. The last of the defenders were overcome on August 20th, but a desperate final action from the Amaris Empire saw all its reserve regiments push south to try and halt the six SLDF armies approaching from that direction. They delayed the inevitable for only a week, and now there was nothing stopping a direct assault on the capital. Every day that passed, numerous dropships made desperate attempts to flee into space, rats fleeing a sinking ship, but most were shot down. One of the few units to escape were the last survivors of the 2nd Mexican Legion. The city itself had just one loyal division left to defend it, commanding General Patrick Scoffin's own 7th Amaris Dragoons. On the opposite coast, one of Amaris's close allies, Director of Economic Development Ashlyn Connor, was picked up by the SLDF at her home in New York, having made no attempt to flee the inevitable. Star League Intelligence was becoming increasingly concerned by the apparent disappearance of another of Amaris's inner circle, OPD Director Lisa Outerbridge. Sightings have become increasingly scarce throughout Operation Liberation, and by 2779, they had lost track of her entirely. The hunt was on to locate one of the SLDF's most wanted. On September 1st, the SLDF began tightening the noose. Third Army cleared the region around Aberdeen, allowing for the safe arrival of the fresh Second Army. 
Two days later, pathfinders from the pride of Puget Sound became the first to lay eyes on Unity City. What they saw was a barren, irradiated landscape. Olympia, Tacoma and Seattle had been all but abandoned due to the damage done to the region during the Amaris coup. Some cleanup had been done to make the capital livable, but it was a shadow of its former glory. Kerensky himself took to the field for the first time since Moscow at the head of the Graham Division. 3rd and 16th armies took point, entering Unity City on September 10th. Naturally, Kerensky became the priority target for the Dragoons, who did everything they could to kill him, some even using suicide tactics. His usual bodyguard was expanded by the addition of the last few survivors of the Royal Black Watch, who had re-established contact during the North American campaign, and together they kept him safe. With such overwhelming numbers on their side, the battle for Unity City wasn't much to write home about. As Kerensky advanced, he came into contact with civilians who warned him that he would not find his quarry within the court of the Starlik. On the 13th, the Tsar Peter division reached the Royal Palace, ignition point for the entire war, and confirmed his fears. Emperor Stefan Amaris was nowhere to be found. The last of the 7th Amaris Dragoons were making a desperate push for the spaceport at this time, but after the destruction of their dropships on September 16th, Patrick Scoffins extended an offer of surrender. The terms of his surrender were simple. In exchange for the fair treatment of the Amaris Empire Armed Forces, Scoffins would give them the location of Emperor Amaris. Kerensky accepted, and his counterparts turned over everything he knew. The Emperor had not set foot in Unity City for years. Since even before Operation Liberation began early in 2777, Amaris had been cooped up within the Imperial Palace constructed by his old friend, First Lord Richard Cameron. It was a well-disguised complex within the nature reserve around Lake Louise, so much so that the 15th Army had marched almost straight over it during their approach towards Unity City. Defending the palace was General Peter Bridge at the head of the last of the Imperial forces, the 4th Amaris Dragoons. The newly arrived 2nd and 19th Armies would encircle the facility, cutting off any chance of escape on the ground. Overhead, Admiral Brandt would command the warship blockade to ensure Amaris didn't flee into space, while Colonel Stephen McKenna provided close air support. Kerensky handed control of the Graham Division to his deputy de Chevalier and tasked them with taking the spaceport, while the commanding general would lead the Pride of Puget Sound and the Lionhearted Division in the main assault on the palace. On September 29th, 0200 Terra Standard Time, a small armada of dropships departed Unity City, heading over the Canadian wilderness. Every battle mech in 3rd Army had been consolidated into the 26th Royal, amounting to just three regiments. This put them on equal footing with the 4th Amaris Dragoons. From high above, they leapt from their dropships and crashed to earth around the spaceport, quickly securing the facility. They held their ground against the best the defenders could throw against them, long enough for the rest of the SLDF to touch down. Together, they overwhelmed and destroyed the 4th Amaris Dragoons, avenging the deaths of the Royal Black Watch, those at the Citadel, and so many others within Unity City during the coup. Together with their escorts, Kerensky and de Chevalier rushed the gates of the Imperial Palace, smashing their way through the last of the defences and prompting the last of the Republican Guard to throw down their weapons. The Star League officers marched their mechs through the towering halls of the palace until they reached the Emperor's private quarters. A young secretary emerged, leading by the arm a tired and feeble old man, Emperor Stefan Amaris. He placed at the feet of Kerensky's mech the jewel-encrusted laser pistol which he had once gifted to Richard Cameron. And with his surrender, the Star League Civil War was over. Well guys, I can't believe we are finally here. After months, literally hundreds of hours of work, the nightmare is finally over. If you have been following the updates I've been putting out on my Patreon this last couple months, then you know just what an ordeal this was for me. More effort has gone into creating just this one chapter than all the other parts of the series combined, and it's not even close. It is by far the most intensive project I've ever worked on. 
and hopefully the last of its kind. I kept telling myself as I was putting it together, don't worry, you never need to do this again. You will never ever do this again. And yet, as I continued to work on it, that gradually shifted in my mind to, you're only ever gonna do this once, so get it right. And the project just grew and grew and grew as I tried to include more and more stuff into it. When I originally wrote this, it was around 10,000 words, which is just over an hour in terms of content. It has ballooned to 16,000, an hour 45 in total. One thing I'd really like to hear is, if you lived in one of the places that was mentioned in this video, what was it like hearing about the action going on outside your front door? Uh, did I pronounce your town name correctly? You can probably hear it at a few points in this video. Uh, the script is an amalgamation of five different tries, and it was a lot of work trying to get it uh, all to mesh correctly. I hope it was worth it and you've enjoyed it. If you have, please leave me a comment, leave me a like, subscribe if you want to see more. The good news is this is the first of a two-part finale and the ending is coming out this time tomorrow. If you want to see how this all concludes, please join me then. As I mentioned, I've got a Patreon if you want to support me directly, but the best thing you can do is share this video around with other people who you think might enjoy it. It's a huge boost to the YouTube algorithm when it sees people coming from outside the platform and spending time on YouTube watching stuff. Either way, I'm really grateful of your support. Once again, this video wouldn't be as good as it is without the contributions of those in the community, so thank you very much to Big Red, Critical Rocket, Death From Above Wargaming, Madcap529, Renegade HPG, and of course Tex. They, like everyone else who's participated in this project, has volunteered their time to help make this a better video for you guys, so please let them know you appreciate it. Check them out if you haven't already.